Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. This week we will be talking about GM Smucker Company. We will be reviewing Smucker's 10K annual report, primarily focusing on its core business, its business segments, and understanding the risk factors and contingent liabilities associated with investing in this company. So let's dive in and look at GM Smucker Company. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that GM Smucker Company filed with the SEC. This annual report is for the fiscal year that ended April 30th, 2020. Let's start off by understanding the core business of Smuckers. Smuckers says that we principally operate in one industry, the manufacturing and marketing of branded foods and beverage products on a worldwide basis. They state that their net sales outside of the United States accounted for about 6% of the consolidated net sales of 2020. This means that about 94% of the net sales of GM Smuckers comes from the United States. Next, Smuggers talks about its recent acquisition of Ainsworth Pet Nutrition, also known as Ainsworth, which was funded by debt and valued at $1.9 billion. And at the end, they'll ask us to look at Note 2 acquisition. So if we quickly look at Note 2, the Note 2 acquisition says that this was an all-cash transaction valued at $1.9 billion. The transaction was funded by a bank term loan and borrowing under our commercial paper program of approximately $1.5 billion and $400 million respectively. Over here, the company states that the purchase price allocation included total intangible assets of $1.3 billion. The purchase price exceeded the estimated fair value of the net identifiable, tangible, and intangible assets acquired. And as a result, the access was allocated to goodwill. And the total goodwill amount was uh, $617.8 million. And so what all this means is that GM Smuckers overpaid for its Ainsworth acquisition by $617 million. And the $617 million will appear in the asset section of the balance sheet. Back to the company. Over here, GM Smuckers talks about how they sold their U.S. baking business. And this sale generated approximately $370 million in 2018. Over here, GM Smuckers says that it reports in four segments. The first is the U.S. retail pet foods. Second is the U.S. retail coffee. Third is the U.S. retail consumer foods. And the last one is international and away from home segment. Smuckers discloses that the U.S. retail market makes up about 87% of the 2020 consolidated net sales. So, so far we know that 94% of Smuckers net sales comes from the United States. And out of that 94%, 87% of its sales comes from the U.S. retail segments. Next, Smuggers talks about its principal products. Our principal products as of April 30, 2020 are coffee, dog food, cat food, pet snacks, peanut butter, fruit spreads, frozen handheld products, shortening and oils, portion control products, juices and beverages, and baking mixes and ingredients. Next, Smuggers talks about the sources and availability of raw materials. The company states that the raw materials used in each of our segments are primarily commodities and agricultural-based products. It says that the availability, quality, and cost of many of these commodities have fluctuated and many continue to fluctuate over time. After that, Smuckers says that the green coffee is subject to high volatility due to factors such as weather, global supply and demand, plant disease, investor speculation, and political and economic conditions in the source countries. Here are some of the major trademarks in each segment. You may have heard some of these, such as Folgers Coffee, Dunkin' Donuts, Jif's Peanut Butter, Smucker's Jelly, Crisco, and so forth. Next, the company talks about the seasonality of the business. And this is important for us investors to look at because seasonality fluctuates the way that cash comes in and goes out of the company. So for the seasonality, the company states that the U.S. retail coffee and U.S. retail consumer foods have been seasonal around the fall, bake, and holiday period. However, the company does state that after its U.S. baking business sale, the U.S. retail consumer food segment has experienced less seasonality. Additionally, its acquisition of Ainsworth in the retail pet food segment has uh, reduced the overall impact of seasonality on the company. After that, the company talks about its working capital. Working capital is simply current assets minus current liabilities. Over here, the company states that the working capital requirements have historically been greatest during the first half of our fiscal year mainly due to the timing of the buildup of coffee, shortening and oils, baking inventory necessary to support the fall bake and holiday period, and the additional buildup of coffee inventory in advance of the Atlantic hurricane season. At the end, the company states that the divestiture of the U.S. baking business and the acquisition of Ainsworth during 2019 have further reduced the seasonality of our overall working capital requirements. After that, Smuckers talks about its customers. 
It discloses that sales to Walmart and subsidiaries amounted to 32%, 32%, and 31% of the net sales in 2020, 2019, and 2018, respectively. And lastly, it says that during 2020, our top 10 customers collectively accounted for approximately 60% of the consolidated net sales. After that, the company talks about the competition. Smucker states that the primary ways in which products and brands are distinguished are brand recognition, product quality, price, packaging, new product introductions, nutritional value, convenience, advertising, promotion, and the ability to identify and satisfy consumer preference. Wow, that's an impressive list. Uh, if you're thinking how moats are built, Smuckers has given you the answer in this one sentence. Next, the company talks about how the packaged food industry has been challenged by a general decline in sales volume. It discloses that certain evolving consumer trends have contributed to the decline, such as heightened focus on health and wellness, an increased desire of fresh foods, and the growing impact of social media and e-commerce on consumer behavior. In the end, Smucker says that we closely monitor the price cap or price premium between our brands and private label brands with the view that value is about more than price and the expectation that number one brands will continue to be an integral part of consumers' shopping baskets. After that, Smuckers gives us this table that outlines the primary products that it offers within each segment, as well as what the competitors have to offer within these segments as well. Now that we have a better understanding of Smuckers' core business, let's look at the risk factors. The annual report had a total of 28 risk factors, and today I will be going over the top five. The first one on the list is that the outbreak of novel coronavirus, COVID-19, could negatively impact our business and results of operations. The company states that the continued spread of COVID-19 throughout the United States and the international community has had and could continue to have a negative impact on financial markets, economic conditions, and portions of our business and industry. Smucker says that a shutdown or slowdown in one or more of its manufacturing facilities due to the illness could disrupt its production capabilities, particularly with respect to coffee production, substantially of which takes place in New Orleans, Louisiana. Smucker says that a slowdown or stoppage of our supply chain could result from government restrictions or labor shortages due to the illness. Additionally, increased consumer demand could put a strain on a supply chain as well. Next, an increase in commodity or other input costs could result from market volatility. A significant portion of our workforce could be unable to work as a result of illness or government restrictions. Next, Smuckers talks about how its goodwill and intangible assets could be impaired if there are sustained changes in consumer purchasing behaviors, government restrictions, financial results, or a deterioration of macroeconomic conditions. Next, Smuckers talks about how the decrease in demand for its away-from-home establishment due to the government restrictions and social distancing measures has adversely affected the operations and could continue to adversely affect the business in the future. Smuckers then says that an increase in working capital needs could occur. This primarily occurs when your current assets are well below your current liabilities. So now you're in a bind where you don't have enough money to pay your current obligations. So it's just saying that that could occur. Next, Smuckers talks about the change in demand, a shift in consumer spending, and a change in trade promotions and marketing activities, all of which could affect Smuckers' business. Smuckers then says that a fluctuation in foreign currency exchange rates or interest rates could result from market uncertainties. It then states that the increase in the cost or the difficulty to obtain debt or better refinancing terms could affect its ongoing operations as well as future investment opportunities. And lastly, it states that regulatory restrictions or continued market volatility could hinder its ability to implement price increases. Those were all the ways that the company could be impacted due to the coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak. The second risk factor states that our results may be adversely impacted as a result of increased costs limited availability and or insufficient quality of raw materials, including commodities and agricultural products. Smucker says that the price of these commodities, agricultural products, and other materials are subject to volatility and could fluctuate due to conditions that are difficult to predict, including global supply and demand, commodity market fluctuations, crop size and yield fluctuations, weather, natural disasters, pandemic illness, such as COVID-19 outbreak, foreign currency fluctuations, investor speculation, trade agreements, political unrest, consumer demand, and changes in governmental agricultural programs. That is a big list of all the things that could impact the prices of these commodities that Smuckers uses. And if the prices of the commodity increases, then that certainly eats into the profit margin of the company. At the end, Smucker says that we may not be able to fulfill the demand of our coffee, 
which could have a materially adverse effect on our business, financial condition, and results of operations. The third risk factor states that we may be limited to our ability to pass cost increases to our customers in the form of price increases or may realize a decrease in sales volume to the extent price increases are implemented. So Smuckers is saying that if there is an increase in the prices of raw materials, energy, or any other input cost, it is going to be hard for them to push that cost onto its customers without losing some of its customers. Smuckers outlines how consumers may be less willing or able to pay a price differential for our branded products and may increasingly purchase lower priced offerings and may forego some purchases altogether, especially during economic downturns. And to make things worse, Smucker says that retailers may also increase levels of promotional activities for lower price offerings as they seek to maintain sales volume during times of economic uncertainty. So the two key takeaways from this risk factor is that increased cost of production and the increased competition could lower Smucker's sales volume. And the second is that Smucker's is unable to increase or set prices on its products as customers would shy away from that product. The fourth risk factor states that our substantial debt obligations could restrict our operational and financial condition. Additionally, our ability to generate cash to make payments on our indebtedness depends on many factors beyond our control. Smucker says that as of April 30, 2020, we had approximately $5.6 billion of short-term borrowing and long-term debt. It says that we may also incur additional indebtedness in the future. Smuckers talks about how its debt service obligation requires it to use portion of its operating cash flow to pay interest and principal on indebtedness rather than for corporate purposes such as expansion projects and ongoing capital expenditures. So what this means is that rather than reinvesting the money in its core business, Smuckers would now have to take some money out to pay off its interest and principal on its indebtedness. Smuckers says that the substantial indebtedness could have other adverse consequences, including first, making it more difficult for us to satisfy our financial obligations. Second is that it increases our vulnerability to adverse economic, regulatory, and economic conditions and places us at a disadvantage compared to our competitors that are less leveraged. The third is that it limits our ability to compete and our flexibility to plan for any changes in the business. The fourth is that it limits our ability to borrow additional funds. And the fifth is that it exposes us to greater interest rate risk. Smucker says that our ability to make payments on our indebtedness will depend on our ability to generate cash in the future. It says that we may need to refinance all or portion of our indebtedness on or before maturity. Any refinancing of our debt could be at higher interest rates and may require make whole payments and compliance with more generous covenants, which could further restrict our business operations. At the end, it states that our failure to comply with the terms of any existing or future indebtedness could result in an event of default, which, if not cured or waived, could result in acceleration of payments of all our debts. So this fourth risk factor can be summed up by saying that indebtedness is equal to debt spiral. Smuckers outlined that it has about $5.6 billion of debt, and if its operational cash flow were to dwindle, it would have a hard time meeting those obligations, which would result in a cascading event that we just went over. The fifth and last risk factor states that a material impairment in the carrying value of acquired goodwill or other intangible assets could negatively affect our consolidated operating results and net worth. Smucker says that a significant portion of our assets is goodwill and other intangible assets, majority of which is not amortized but reviewed for impairment on at least annual basis. It says that the value of goodwill and other intangible assets totaled $12.7 billion compared to total assets of $17 billion and total shareholders' equity of $8.2 billion. So 75% of Smucker's total assets is goodwill and other intangible assets. So you may be thinking, why is impairment of goodwill and intangible assets such a big deal? It is because if we think about the balance sheet, it is made up of assets, liabilities, and shareholders' equity. Assets are equal to liabilities plus shareholders' equity. And if you have an impairment in your asset, your goodwill, your value of your asset has to go down, your liabilities are still going to be the same. You still have to owe the bank what you owe the bank. And the only other thing that would have to go down in order to balance this equation would be the shareholder's equity. So if you have an impairment in your asset, you will have your shareholder's equity decrease as well. And shareholder's equity is your money within the company. That is the amount that you would get if the company were to liquidate today. So in short, impaired assets would cause shareholder's equity to go down. So those were the top five risk factors of investing in GM Smucker Company. Now let's look at the contingent liabilities associated with this business.
Hey guys, note 16 of the annual report goes over the contingencies. Over here, Smucker says that uh, based on the information known to date, with the exception of the matter disclosed below, we do not believe the final outcome of these proceedings will have a materially adverse effect on our financial position, results of operation, and cash flow. So the matters now discussed that we'll be going over this case is the only one that Smuckers thinks is going to have a materially adverse effect. Smucker says that on May 9, 2011, CERT filed a lawsuit in the Supreme Court of the state of California. In this court case, the plaintiff alleges that Smuckers and 80 other defendants failed to provide warnings for their coffee products of the exposure to chemical acrylamide as required under Proposition 65. Smucker says that the civil penalties associated with this violation could be up to $2,500 per day per violation. The plaintiff asserts that every consumed cup of coffee absent of compliant warning is equivalent to a violation under Proposition 65. The defendants, which include Smuckers, say that acrylamide is not added to coffee but is inherently present in all coffee in small amounts measured in parts per billion as a byproduct of the coffee bean roasting process. After a couple court decisions that went in the plaintiff's favor, on June 15, 2018, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment issued a proposed regulation clarifying the cancer warnings are not required for coffee under Proposition 65. Additionally, during the third quarter of 2020, CERT filed several motions seeking judgment in its favor as a matter of law, and the defendants also filed their own motions. In uh, this past quarter, CERT issued discovery requests seeking information regarding acrylamide and coffee flavoring. As you can see, this is an ongoing case, and Smucker says that we are unable to predict or reasonably estimate the potential loss or effect on our operations. Smucker says that the significant labeling and warning requirements could be potentially imposed by the trial court, which increases our costs and adversely affects sales of our coffee products. Meaning these requirements could be expensive and cause operational disruption, which could have a material adverse impact on our financial position. So that was the one and only contingent liability that Smuckers thinks could have a materially adverse effect on the company. As you can see, if each violation is going to be worth $2,500, multiplied by the number of times, the number of cups that were sold without the warning labels, that number can certainly add up. Hey guys, before I end this video, I wanted to quickly go over Note 10, which is the derivative financial instruments. As we saw in the risk factor, Smuckers has a direct exposure to increasing commodity prices, foreign exchange rates, interest rates, and Smuckers here outlines that it uses derivatives to hedge that risk. The first is the commodity price management. Smuckers says that it enters into commodity derivatives to manage the price volatility and reduce the variability of future cash flows related to anticipated inventory purchases of key raw materials. The second is the foreign currency exchange rate hedging. Over here, Smucker says that we utilize foreign currency derivatives to manage the effect of foreign currency exchange fluctuations on future cash payments, particularly related to purchases of certain raw materials and finished goods. And lastly, it talks about the interest rate hedging, where it says that we utilize derivative instruments to manage interest rate risk associated with anticipated debt transactions, as well as manage changes in the fair value of our long-term debt. So those were the ways that Smuckers uses derivatives to its advantage to limit its risk associated with commodity price fluctuations, foreign currency exposure, as well as interest risk fluctuations. Hey guys, that is all I have for you this week. We looked at Smuckers for business. If you find this content interesting, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.